Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and it's time for part two of the Q&A, so uh, let me get my hat on, and uh, let's finish this up. All right, first question. Jason, I have noticed that I can lock out on bench presses, overhead presses, etc., but when I do an exercise like rope push downs, it seems extremely difficult to lock out at the bottom, especially in my left arm. Keep in mind that this is with the light, moderate weight. Uh, is there any sort of common explanation for this? Thanks, Jason. P.S. I have never had an injury or pain in my triceps. All right, brother, you're not going to like my answer because it's not a light weight. It's higher than your max. You're using heavier than your one rep max on a push down. If the first rep is really hard to lock out, that's your max. The problem is that the rope push down, the way a lot of them are designed on a pulley system, um, the hardest part of the exercise anyway is the lockout, and then the pulley puts it into such a position that there's less weight at the top. Um, so when you think about that, the answer should be really, really obvious. The answer is that because the weight at the top half of it is something you could probably crank out for 20 reps, it feels easy, but the overall exercise, you're probably doing your one to two rep max at the bottom uh, if it's really, really hard to lock out. You're going too heavy. Now, you might be saying, well, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> It's really easy through the first part if it's so heavy and then I, I drop it down to where I can lock out easier, the exercise feels useless. Yeah, it might be useless. Um, rope press downs really uh, aren't all that great. I, I think it's kind of bodybuilder fluff. I think they have their uses if done correctly to get shoulder extension if you just want something different. But I think most people, what they're trying to do with a rope press down, they could probably do with a dumbbell a lot better. Just throwing that out there, laying down with dumbbells. Um, or even standing with dumbbells behind two arms. Uh, just a consideration. All right, next question. Dear Jason, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how to deal with binge eating, compulsive eating when cutting, and in general. I was trying to lose two to three kilograms, but I struggled due to some cravings of sugary foods I had that uh, ruined quickly the progress I made with my diet. Any suggestion would be highly appreciated because I really hate having these cravings. Thank you a lot. All right, um, this is kind of the, the point that we get to of why I don't like flexible dieting and if it fits your macros. This sort of stuff works really well for people who don't have cravings and food addictions and voracious appetites. Um, you're going to have to just avoid sweets. If sweets are your thing, avoid sweets unless you can get calorie-free stuff. What um, can be helpful for people who really do crave sweets, some sugar-free jello, diet soda. Those are going to be your friends to satiate your sweet tooth. Fortunately for me, I have cravings. I obviously have an absurd appetite, but I don't crave sweets. Like I can take them or leave them, quite frankly. Um, I crave salty, fatty food. I crave fatty food. Like I, I'll crave cheese and peanut butter and pizza uh, when I'm cutting. Historically, those are the foods that I crave, salt and fat added together. Uh, and by that same token, I know that I have to be very, very careful about eating those foods because it'll sabotage uh, my diet. Like for me, generally, even year round, I, that's just foods I can't get away with eating three or four times a week. Maybe one day a week, I'll have days to where I'll eat stuff like that and I'll time it to around social events and stuff like that. So if I eat stuff like that, it's going to be in the evening uh, at a social event type thing rather than something I'm just going to go do myself. I've just learned this the hard way over the years. It just doesn't work. Um, as I'll way overeat these foods. And if I start eating them in the morning, they'll make me hungrier. And that's the thing with food cravings. People need to remember your trigger foods, your foods that you crave if you're a binge eater or you have an insane appetite, they're almost a drug-like addiction. Um, and they don't fill you up. They make you hungrier. And that's what people need to understand. Just like someone who, who is a heroin addict, when they take a little bit of heroin, they don't feel all of a sudden satisfied and don't want to do more. Uh, and people have food addictions. There are trigger foods. Food addiction is a very real thing, and it makes sense why we have food addictions. It has helped us survive famines and ice ages as a species. It's a very, very valuable thing. There's a reason we as a species are prone to obesity. Uh, it helps us survive. It's a very valuable trait to have until you get in a place where we have an abundance of food and unlimited foods like America, and then it makes you fat and kills you. Uh, unfortunately, but see through the majority of human history, most people have never been in that situation. So what keeps you alive in some situations will get you killed in others. It's a very unfortunate thing, uh, but you got to learn to work around it. All right, next question. Do you think the dumbbell chest press, all angles, are a good accessory exercise given that you can go down further with them? Would this help your lower end on your bench and possibly reduce your chances of injury 
given that you trained your muscles in that deeper range now? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, if you're weak at the bottom of your bench press and you're doing tons of bench pressing and you feel like you need a little more mobility at the bottom, I think dumbbell presses, whether they're flat, incline, decline, I think are an absolutely amazing accessory exercise for your bench press. No argument from me there. Um, I'll go so far as to say that for people with really lagging chest, the incline dumbbell press uh, really seems to be a winner for someone who needs to bring their chest up, particularly like their whole upper chest up here. Uh, fantastic accessory exercise. So actually I would throw that up there as one of the top exercises for improving your bench press in addition uh, to various overhead pressing. Uh, again, depending upon where your weaknesses are. But yeah, but for people who really are weak out of the bottom of the bench press, who are already doing a lot of long pause benching and they still feel that the bottom is, is a very, very serious weakness for them, uh, I agree with you. That deeper stretch you get can train you to be better out of the bottom of the bench press if you perform the dumbbell presses correctly, which I have videos on. Uh, fantastic accessory for this. Um, and yeah, I do agree with you because it trains the longer range of motion more often. I think it can reduce your chances of injury on the bench press itself. And that kind of goes back to a point of sometimes different accessory movements that we do can strengthen uh, our body in different positions and angles that can reduce our chances of injury when handling really, really heavy weights on our main exercises. There is something to be said for that and you just hit a perfect example. So well done there. All right, next question. Hi Jason, I recently got back to heavy deadlifting two times a week with moderate heavy weight. My problem is that I get a lower back pain and I'm 99% sure it's because of my lower back rounding plus my big leverages. I'm six foot seven. Any advice? Skip out a lot of his other questionnaire. We don't need it for this. All right, brother. Um, yeah, you're overworking your lower back. You're tall. You have long leverages. You're one of those guys who can't deadlift heavy multiple times per week. Sorry about that. That's reality. Uh, cut back to deadlifting heavy once a week moderately heavy. Uh, you can build your lower back and your power on the deadlift doing other exercises. Uh, come in and do some power cleans, do some hang cleans, pin lay rows. All right, that's what you need to be focusing on. Don't pull heavy more than once a week for someone with you because your lower back is not recovering from it. And it has to do with your personal leverages and that's just reality. But you know what? You can build a massive deadlift with moderately heavy once a week. Um, come in and do all these other accessory movements to build everything else up and particularly stuff like I think for people with your anatomic position this is what something Bill Starr noted because keep in mind Bill Starr worked with a lot of football players program was written for football players a lot of football players are tall with big frames he didn't have them deadlift more than once a week he had them use power cleans and other accessories like that to build their deadlift strength uh, there's no reason you can't do the same thing. Look at the different athletes who've been trained by coaches over the years before you, and you'll notice that that is uh, with taller athletes like that, only deadlifting once a week sometimes is the way that you have to go, and then you use accessories to build those muscles and build that neural efficiency. That's where things like the power cleans become very, very effective for a taller lifter like you. Uh, give that a whirl instead. I think you'll be happy with it, and I think it'll sort out those lower back problems for you. Uh, and in the meantime, get a lot of heat on that lower back, keep it stretched, do some hangs so that you decompress it a little bit, hang from a chin-up bar, soak it in some hot baths, some Epsom salts. Uh, and if you got a girl who gives you a good lower back rub, do that also. All right, next question. I have two loves in the fitness world, uh, one lifting weights and two cycling. What are your thoughts on the best way to combine the two? If I wanted to achieve better cycling legs, so to speak, what do you think would be a good way to achieve this? I'm really enjoying putting your advice into practice, but have not been able to continue my cycling as I believe my legs would be overworked. Uh, your thoughts would be much appreciated. I really enjoy your vlogs, and I wish I discovered you earlier. Keep up the good work. Cheers. Um, check out Alex Viata's work. I have interviewed Alex Viata uh, on Skype before on this channel. Uh, good guy, really, really knowledgeable guy. He trains hybrid athletes. He himself is a hybrid athlete. Uh, so you're asking, can you do this? Yeah, he cycles for hours every week. Uh, Viata does two different types of powerlifting competitively. Uh, he does super marathons and he does triathlons. And he does a lot of extreme cycling events. You can absolutely balance them, but it is a matter of programming. Uh, it's, this is really 
not something I can cover in just an individual video ever. Uh, but check out his book, The Hybrid Athlete. Uh, go to Alex Viata's website. Um, I believe it's called Complete Human Performance. I think you're going to find for your specific needs, someone who isn't in, wants to do endurance endeavors but still lift heavy and train hard, I think you're going to find uh, Viata's work feels that he specializes in the niche you're talking about. This is his area of expertise. I think you're going to find him to be a gold mine of information. So go check that out. Remember, complete human performance. Uh, I think that's going to be right up your alley, brother. All right, next question. Hey, Jason. First of all, I'd like to say thanks for the informative videos as always. I understand your thoughts on elevated heels during a squat, squat shoes. Um, I was wondering if you have a similar stance in regards to elevated toes during a deadlift variation example Romanian deadlifts thanks no brother don't don't do anything with elevated toes on your deadlift uh, again the hamstrings are going to get stretched enough on Romanian deadlifts in fact anytime you start messing with heel placement on the on the deadlift like if you were to use lifting shoes with the elevated heel you're going to find that uh, your hamstrings and things get a lot more work because you're actually creating turning it into a deficit deadlift but no absolutely do not do not elevate your toes on a deadlift don't let anyone convince you to do silly shit like that uh, and remember don't ever stand on plates or devices of any type to lift this is silly bodybuilder shit they've come up with instead of wearing proper shoes to do things like squatting with your heels on plates it's dangerous it's risky uh, don't risk tearing a muscle seeking some silly perceived benefit and no one makes elevated toe shoes um, but keep in mind, I think that that would be a good way to potentially tear a hamstring. So I just can't advocate it, can't recommend it. And quite frankly, you should be able to do just fine on deadlifts of different types of normal old shoes. Uh, nice flat-heeled shoes or work boots uh, should be able to do whatever you want with a deadlift. Uh, don't worry about that. All right, next question. Hi Jason, you talked about the body shutting down its reproductive drive when you go into true starvation mode. There is no starvation mode. You are starving. That's the difference. You're starving. That's not a mode. It's starvation is the word. Uh, under 8% body fat. Actually, no, it's under about 10% for most guys. In order to try and keep you alive, why is it that plants often do the opposite? When you try and kill a plant, it will often develop a flower stem in a last effort spreading its genetics before it dies. Shouldn't the body try and reproduce before you die? Thanks. A um, little bit different of a question, but all right, let, let's cover this briefly. Uh, what is the purpose of reproduction? It's to continue the species. We, as all species on earth, we have reproductive habits that are most likely to ensure that our species perpetuates and that our genetic line perpetuates. With a plant, Plants don't raise their young. There's no uh, pregnancy involved. There's no raising of the young. A plant seeds drop out there and those plants grow fine on their own. The parent has no role in their development, nothing else. So if a flower is going to die, the best way that that flower's genes would be passed on would be for it to fling seeds everywhere, right? Makes sense? Because it has no role in it. As a human being, we have a nine-month gestation period. Pregnant women historically all through history not the, not now that we have food stamps and we can wick and all that stuff and um, you know welfare and things pregnant women don't die all right when there's no man around pregnant women do die when we don't live in a, a modern society all right they can't care for themselves as well they need more food they can't move as much uh, same thing with a growing child a child is more likely to survive if it's got a father in the role who can hunt, protect it, uh, protect it from predators, from other people who can go get food for it. It's more likely to survive. All right, we don't reproduce when we're starving because sex burns calories. All right, so your body, and that's the reason your sex drive starts going down dramatically when you start getting leaner. Your testosterone goes down. It's because uh, if you're starving, the last thing your body wants you to do is focus on reproduction because you're more likely to die it's more likely to kill you and if you die before your offspring uh, are, are old enough to care for themselves their chances of surviving are lower so your genes are less likely to be passed on our reproductive strategy as a species revolves around our ability to number one survive long enough 
for our, our genes to be passed on, all right? For them to actually be passed on and be survivable. Uh, human babies require a lot of care compared to most other species. I'm not going to get into all the details of why that is. There are biological reasons. Uh, but we require more care. So men who run around and try to have sex and chase pussy and everything when they're starving are more likely to die before they actually have sex multiple times and pass their genes on. If their sex drive goes back up once they're well fed, they're more likely to survive long enough to reproduce. Because the actual act of reproduction could kill you if you're starving. It could push you over the edge or the act of even chasing women if you're not getting enough calories, could push you further into starvation and kill you. So yeah, our sex drives go down. And again, by that same token, you're less likely to have your offspring survive. You're more likely to have your offspring survive if your sex drive drops until you're able to get enough food and enough body fat and everything else to survive. Um, so therefore, people whose sex drives are higher when they're eating more and lower when they're starving are more likely for their genes to be passed on and survive for them to pass their genes on. So therefore, that seems to be the dominant trait in our species. So men who are really ripped and lean, their sex drives go down. Sometimes they have erectile dysfunction. And again, that's to ensure the survival of their offspring. They don't need to be reproducing uh, out in the wild or in a tribal lifestyle or before we have modern society if they can't get enough food to eat. It doesn't work. It's bad for the survival of the species. So you're comparing two completely different species that have a completely different reproductive strategy. So no, the answer is absolutely not. It's not how it works. All right, next question. I'm starting to notice some forearm pain on the outside of it, near the middle between the wrist and elbow when I bench. Okay, I mainly do close grip and widened it a little, but it's still there. Any ideas? Uh, yeah, a couple things. Your bar path and your grip are wrong. Particularly on the, on the closed grip bench, it'll be more pronounced. If you're doing this, meaning see where my arm just went? So if you're pressing up here, watch the closed grip. If you're doing this, notice my wrist bent back. See that? That puts that stress on there. It's very easy because you're almost turning it into, um, what's that type of press called? I forget what it's called. Uh, West Side Barbell is really, really big on it. There's a specific press where they have you do that with light weight. All right, you're bending the forearm back. That's not good. It means you're benching too high on the chest for a close grip. So if you're benching up to here, that's why you're, you're seeing that. Notice my arm position. I'm benching up above the nipple line. Watch what happens when I bring it further down. All right, notice I'm more in line. If you touch down here, the forearms are more at 90 degrees from the floor. Uh, you're benching too high on your chest and you're probably gripping the bar wrong. You're probably gripping the bar like this Trying to do a, a strict overhand like that when in reality it's because you got the bar here bar needs to be here All right, see the difference the angle Right here, and then you grip around the bar not like this. So this hand is the bar You don't want to do this. This is what you do on a proper bench press so Then you're out like this when you come down and press so that's usually what's going on. There's your problem, brother. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.